of the satisfaction of Christ. Though the doctrine of satisfaction is not only closely connected with, but even included in the doctrine of redemption, made by paying a satisfactory price into the hands of justice, and is a part of it, yet it is of such importance that it requires it should be distinctly and separately treated of. It is the glory of the Christian religion which distinguishes it from others, what gives it the preference to all others, and without which it would be of no value itself. And though the word satisfaction is not symbolically expressed in Scripture, as used in the doctrine under consideration, the thing is absolutely declared in it. Which yet, Socinus denies, though he himself owns that a thing is not to be rejected because not expressly found in Scripture. For he says, it is enough with all lovers of truth that the thing in question is confirmed by reason and testimony. Though the words which are used in expressing the question are not found expressly written, what Christ has done and suffered in the room instead of sinners, with content, well-pleasedness and acceptable in the sight of God, is what may be properly called satisfaction. And this is plentifully spoken of in the word of God, as when God is said to be well-pleased with Christ's righteousness, for Christ's righteousness' sake, and with it being answerable to the demands of law and justice, and is in honouring and magnifying of it. And when the sacrifice of Christ, and such his sufferings are, is said to be of a sweet-smelling savour to God, because it has expiated sin, atoned for it, that is, made satisfaction for it, and taken it away, which the sacrifices under the law could not do. Hence, here was a remembrance of it every year, Isaiah 42.21, Ephesians 5.2. And there are terms and phrases which are used of Christ and of his work as propitiation, reconciliation, atonement, which are equivalent and synonymous to satisfaction for sin and expressive of it, concerning which may be observed the following things. 1. The necessity of satisfaction to be made for sin in order to the salvation of sinners, for without satisfaction for sin there can be no salvation from it. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, to bring many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. That is, it became the all-wise and all-powerful former and maker of all things for himself. It was agreeable to his nature perfections. It was fitting and so necessary that it should be done, that whereas it was his pleasure to bring many of the sons of men, even as many as are made the sons of God, to eternal glory and happiness by Christ, that the author of their salvation should perfectly and completely suffer in the room instead, all that the law and justice of God could require, without which not a sinner could be saved, nor a son brought to glory. If two things are granted, which surely must easily be granted, satisfaction for sin will appear necessary. 1a. That men are sinners, and this must be owned, unless any can work themselves up into a, such a fancy that they are innocent of all such things, those whose natures are not depraved, their actions wrong, neither offensive to God nor injurious to their fellow creatures, and if so indeed, that a satisfaction for sin would be unnecessary. And one would think the opposers of Christ's satisfaction must have entertained such a conceit of themselves. But if they have scripture, all experience, the conscience of men, the facts are against them, all which declare men are sinners, are transgressors of the law, and pronounce guilty by it before God, and are subject to its curse, condemnation of death, and sanction of it. And every transgression of it, and disobedience to it, has received, does receive, will receive, a just recompense of reward, that is, righteous judgment and punishment, either in the sinner himself, or in a surety for it. Hebrews 2.2 2. God never relaxes the sanction of the law, that is, the punishment for sin. It threatens, though he favourably admits one to suffer it for the delinquent, by sin men are alienated from God, set at a distance from him with respect to communion, and without reconciliation or satisfaction for sin, they never can be admitted to it. A sinner, not reconciled to God, can never enjoy 
nearness to him and fellowship with him. And this, when ever had, is the fruit of Christ's sufferings and death. He suffered in the room instead of the unjust, to bring them to God, and it is by his blood making peace for them that they that were afar off with respect to communion are made nigh and favoured with it. 1 Peter 3.18, Ephesians 2.13.14 The satisfaction of Christ does not procure the love of God, being the effects of it, yet it opens the way to the embraces of his arms, stopped by sin. Moreover, men by sin are declared rebels against God and enemies to him. Hence, reconciliation, atonement, or satisfaction become necessary, as they are enemies in their minds by wicked works. Yea, their carnal mind is enmity itself against God, and on the other hand, on the part of God, there is a law enmity which must be slain, and was slain through the sufferings of Christ on the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, Ephesians 2.16, and so made peace and reconciliation for this design, not any internal disposition in the mind of God's people before conversion, which is overcome by it, by the love of God implanted in them, but the declared enmity of the moral law against them, broken by them, of which the ceremonial law was a symbol in the slain sacrifices of it, and stood as an handwriting against them, all which were necessary to be removed. 1b. The other thing to be taken for granted is that it is the will of God to save sinners, at least some of them. For if it was not his will to save any from sin, there would be no need for a satisfaction for it. Now it is certain that it is the will and resolution of God to save some whom he appointed not to the wrath they deserve, but to salvation by Christ, whom he has ordained to eternal life, and are vessels of mercy are for prepared for glory and for whose salvation a provision is made in the council and covenant of grace, in which it was consulted, contrived and settled, and Christ appointed to be the author of it, and who, in the fullness of time, was sent and came about it, and has obtained it, and which is ascribed to his blood and his sufferings and death, which are necessary for the accomplishment of it. Some have affirmed that God could forgive sin and save sinners without a satisfaction. And this is said not only by Sakinians, but by some of Twist, Dr. Goodwin, Rutherford, who own that a satisfaction is made and the fit and expedience of it. But then, this is giving up the point. For if it is fitting and expedient to be done, it is necessary. For whatever is fitting to be done in the affair of salvation, God cannot but do it, or will it to be done, besides such a way of talking as it tends to undermine and weaken the doctrine of satisfaction, so to encourage and strengthen the hands of the Zacchaeans. This, the opposers of it, much the same arguments being used by the one as by the other. It is not indeed proper to limit the Holy One of Israel, or lay a restraint on its power, which is unlimited, boundless and infinite, with whom nothing is impossible, and who is able to do more than we can conceive of. Yet it is no ways derogatory to the glory of his power, nor is it any impeachment of it, nor argues any imperfections or weakness in him to say there are some things he cannot do, for not to be able to do them is his glory, as that he cannot commit iniquity, which is contrary to the purity and holiness of his nature. He cannot do an act of injustice to any of his creatures. That is contrary to his justice and righteousness. He cannot lie. That is contrary to his veracity and truth. He cannot deny himself, for that is against his nature and perfections. And for the same reason, he cannot forgive sin without a satisfaction, because so to do does not agree with the perfections of his nature. It is a vain thing to dispute about the power of God what he can do and what he cannot do, in any case where it is plain that it is his will. As it is in the case before us, at the same time he declares himself a God gracious and merciful, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, he has in the strongest terms affirmed that he will by no means clear the guilty, Exodus 34, 6 and 7, Jeremiah 30, 11, Nehemiah 1, 1 
Numbers 14, 18. Or let him go unpunished, that is without a satisfaction. Besides, if any other method could have been taken, consistent with the will of God, the prayer of Christ would have brought it out. Father, if it be possible, let this cup of suffering, death, pass from me. And then adds, not my will, but thy will be done. What that will was is obvious. Hebrews 10, 5-10. 